So let's get started. So um, first and foremost, right? Um, in case this is your first uh, NUS Hackers workshop, uh, let me tell you more about NUS Hackers. So we are a group uh, dedicated to spreading hacker culture within uh, the School of Computing as well as the wider NUS and Singapore community. And uh, these are our main events. So Friday Hacks is a weekly Friday uh, just meet up as well as a sharing session where people talk about their projects um, and whatever. Right. Uh, in the past, when it was in person, and in fact, we are returning to some in-person sessions, right? If you're from NUS, if you're an NUS student or staff, you can attend. Um, then we used to serve food, right? Um, and then we have Hacker School and Hacker Tools, two of our workshop series, and finally our uh, annual hackathon, Hack and Roll, right? So if you want to know more, you can check out our website at um, nushackers.org. Okay. So uh, what you will learn today we will learn how to use a shell, right? Um, what is a shell? Uh, we will also talk about that, right? And then you will learn how to create shell scripts to automate things, right? And you can do a lot of things from shell scripts, right? Uh, you know, even things like, uh, yeah, you, you can do a lot of things, right? Whatever you can do from using command line utilities, you can do using the shell or shell scripts. Okay, so let's go on. So what is Unix? Okay, before that, what is a Unix-like environment, right? Uh, if you're running Linux, Mac, uh, you are fine. I'm sure most of you, I'm sure you have looked at the um, uh, setup details already, right? Um, yeah, just make sure you can run Bash. Um, yeah, if, you're, if you don't have Bash on Mac, you may have to do this, right? Uh, I think this in installs some uh, developer utilities. If you're running BSD, I don't think anyone here will be running BSD, right? But um, if you are, that is also a Unix-like environment, right? Um, if anyone is running other Unix-like OSs, I highly doubt it, but you'll probably have Bash as well. Um, yeah, so if you are from computing, you will know this thing called Sunfire. Sunfire is running this thing called Solaris, or actually its successor called uh, Sun OS. Right? And then finally, if you're on Windows, you can choose to use uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux. That is also, I guess that counts as a Unix-like environment. Um, okay, but ultimately, as long as you can run Bash, uh, good enough, right? Uh, just as long as you're not using this thing called MSYS2. Right, please don't use this. Okay, so what is Unix, right? Um, Unix is a family of operating systems, right? Um, it originated in the 1970s. Um, you know, in, uh, is it called Bell Labs, I think, right? And uh, yeah, it popularized the use of the well, interactive command line as a way to interact with a computer, right? And you can see, yeah, Bell Labs, uh, Unix, and then after that, we have lots of different uh, OSs that basically sort of derived from it, right? Uh, BSD, you know, and the rest of it. Uh, Solaris, yeah, X, whatever. Uh, and Linux. Linux is not exactly, say, derived directly from uh, Unix, right? So the you see BSD, all these have direct lines connected to um, Unix, and that's because those operating systems are actually, you know, developed directly from Unix in a sense that they took the Unix source code and then developed on it. Uh, Linux is not. U Linux is like um, basically written from, you know, scratch by Linus Torvalds, I mean, initially, right? Um, but it's just that the interface it, it sort of resembles Unix and that's why we call it a Unix-like operating system. So um, one of the things that came with Unix, right, is this thing called the Unix philosophy. And you may or may not notice it in uh, uh, the way a lot of command line utilities are designed, right? But the main idea is that, uh, well, the, the primary idea is the first one, right? The, that uh, programs should do one thing and they should do that one thing well. Um, that's why you see on Linux, we have, on, on, uh, on not, not just Linux, but on Unix, we have many different, uh, you know, small utilities that do things. For example, you have a utility to list files, you have a utility to move files, copy files, etc. All these are separate programs, right? Um, and they just do, they just focus on their one job and being able to do that job well. Uh, and the other parts of the Unix philosophy are also to write programs that can work together, 
right? Uh, and we will see how this works out later on. But you are able to sort of compose uh, programs. And um, when I say compose, means that you can use one program to produce part of, you, you know, you use multiple programs together to achieve a bigger result, right? Uh, work together, right? And the other, the last thing is also that programs like to um, should handle text streams, right? Um, and we'll see what this means in a bit. So this is a Unix philosophy. But the main thing, of course, is the first point, right? Right, programs that do one thing and that do that one thing well. Okay, so that's some introduction. So now let's move on to the shell proper, right? Uh, so what is a shell, right? A shell, a shell basically describes anything that is a text uh, interface to any computer, right? Uh, you can have different, lots of different shells. Um, yeah, the, the idea of a shell is just something you can use to interact with a computer. Uh, that, that, that's what the sh word shell means. So your Windows command line could be a, it's also a shell, right? But we're not talking about Windows here, of course. Um, and yeah. So the shell also, by virtue of how the Unix shell is developed, right? It, it also sort of lets you write scripts, right? Um, yeah. And so that is a shell. Now, um, the when you have a shell you have some program that is of interpreting your commands and we call this your shell interpreters kind of right or short uh, for short we just call it shell as well right um, so it, when we talk about the interpreter is this this is the program that actually you know uh, reads your commands and then does things based on them right uh, and depending on your interpreter the language or syntax you use will be different Right. So what we are focusing on is the most common shell by far, right? Which is the POSIX compatible SH as well as Bash, which is a uh, POSIX compatible shell. So yeah. And then uh, you know there are other shells that you can explore if you like. Uh, there are many many of them. Like there's uh, CSH. This is a C-like shell. There is a Fish ZSH, and uh, you know even PowerShell is a shell, right? Uh, it's just totally different from. Um, the Unix based shells, but there, there are people who swear by PowerShell, uh, which I don't understand, but okay. To each their own. Um, yeah. Uh, personally, I use ZSH as my primary shell. Um, but ZSH is kind of just, uh, is in some ways, it's just bash with some improvements um, in terms of, say, completion features and this and that. Um, in terms of the syntax, it's rather similar. It's mostly the same, but there are some differences in behavior as well. Uh, but yeah. But anyway, uh, for today, we'll just focus on SH and Bash. But you can always go and explore other shells uh, if you are interested. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the shell prompt, right? So uh, this is a shell prompt. Um, this is the prompt, right? The prompt is just this, right? What, where you key in your commands, right? Um, in terms of script execution time, which shell is the fastest? There is this shell called Dash. It's, I mean, based on the name, right? It's written to be fast. <laughs> you can tell based on the name, right? That, uh, so there are certain distributions that use Dash as the default shell just because it's the fastest. But honestly, uh, if you're writing, if you're writing shell, uh, shell scripts, I, I don't think that uh, execution speed is your biggest concern. La. <laughs> Normally, execution speed isn't that of a problem right if you if you are worried about performance you should not be using a shell script right uh, to do any computation or what the shell normally a shell script uh, you wouldn't yeah you wouldn't do anything intensive it's mainly used to glue things together right uh, and i will talk about that in a bit anyway um so the shell prompt this is a prompt la. this is where you key in your programs and uh, th th we call this a prompt right Okay, so uh, let's just get started with some common uh, commands, right? So the first command that uh, I would introduce is the man or manual command, right? This lets you open manual pages for a particular command. So, um, right. so um, if I just type man, it'll tell me, it'll ask me what I want, right? But I can open the manual page for a command, for example, man ls. And it will tell you uh, basically what are uh, what this command does, right? And also what flags you can use, um, you know, and 
tells you what each flag does, you know, um, gives you probably, uh, you know, uh, and even tells you the exit status, right? Um, which we'll probably talk about in a bit later on. Yeah. So that's a manual page. And um, this is the first place you should go to if you're not sure how to use a command. Um, most, you know, most traditional shell commands should have a manual page, but it's getting quite common, like especially more modern, or not modern, but newer uh, command line utilities may not come with a manual pages, right? In that case, you can always do things like um, you can use dash dash help. Most of the time, that should give you some help as well. Uh, this help is built into the command itself, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, two ways. Normally, if there is a manual page, it's usually a bit longer and it will elaborate more on things. The built-in help of a command is usually a bit shorter, briefer, right? And uh, certain commands may even give you a Oh no. Yeah. Certain commands may give you a even briefer mm, sort of uh, help depending on what you specify. For example, if I do git help, I get this. And if I do git dash h, it tells me a shorter. Okay, actually, yeah. It will give you a summary of the options. Right, let's see this. Yeah, so uh, different commands will have uh, different ways of showing the help, but the universal ones are usually uh, dash dash help, right? And also, and of course, the manual page. So that's how you can get help regarding uh, command, right? And um, so there is manual, there is this man page. That's how you can open. Um, that's how you can open up a manual page, right? But how do you? Let's say you don't even know the name of the command. Uh, how can you? search for a command, you know. There are various utilities you can use apropos. Right? Uh, it will search the title of the, and, and you can get a lot of things. And you can see how to use apropos. Um, so, right? Um, and this will tell you the list of manual pages that it has, right? Uh, so that's one command you can use. Um, so one thing about manual pages is um, maybe I can look at the man. Yeah. So you you notice that I just now keyed in this dash s one. Um, this is to specify uh, the section manual page section, right? Um, so different um, different sections contain different things, right? So if you're looking for commands, you just want to look in section one, right? Uh, and how do you find this? You just look up the manual page for man. <laughs> so man, man, right? Okay, so that is how, that is the manual command and how to search for manual pages. Okay, so let's get into actual commands that, you know, we can actually do things. So. Um, the second command, cd, right? Um, so you will notice that our command here, what is this s, right? Um, your prompt will likely have something similar, right? Uh, this is the current working directory, right? Uh, what is the current working directory? Basically, um, it's where by it's where things will happen by default, right? Uh, for example, later on we have um, uh, let's say we have ls, right? Uh, ls, when we do ls, we are listing files in directories, but where are we listing these files and directories from, right? We, we, what, what files and directories are we listing? We're listing the, by default, you don't specify anything, it will list the files and directories of the current working directory, right? So how do you change that current working directory? You use CD, which stands for change directory, right? Quite, quite clear. Um, and the last command here also relevant, which is print the working directory, right? So PWD, and uh, it will tell you the path of the current working directory. And if I want to change the working directory, I can just specify a path, right? So I can cd slash tmp. And then uh, again, uh, usually paths are relative. So I can also cd, let's say, uh, previously I was in slash temp slash s. So if I want to go back to s, I'm currently in tmp, I can cd s. And that's how you, uh, yeah, that's how you change directories. Um, then we have ls. Okay, I have nothing in this directory. 
and you want to go to a parent directory, you can see the dot dot. Dot dot is a special uh, directory name that refers to the parent directory. So now I'm in the parent directory and I can do ls. And uh, you can see here, you know, I have uh, various files in my temp temporary directory. And I'm going to cd back to s. Uh, let me clear my... Okay. So now I want to make a directory. How do I make a directory? I can just make a directory. My directory, right? And you can ls again. You can see your directory is there. And uh, let's say I want to remove a directory. Or well, let's say I want to... Yeah. Let's say I want to remove a directory. Let me do... Um, yeah, rm. So to remove a directory, there are multiple ways, right? One way is to rm-r, my directory. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about what this dash r means when we get to flags. Um, the reason is you need this flag is that rm does not normally remove directories by default. It only remove files. So if I were to create a file, right? So we can use our... Um, So I'm just going to create a file, right? You can use your any other way to create a file. Um, let me add one more command here, right? Uh, to touch. Okay. So I create a file. And then now you will see that the file is there. If I do rm file, it will remove the file. The file is no longer there. So I was talking about touch. What is touch? Touch is a utility to basically touch a file. Or basically it will set the modification date to the current time uh, even without changing the file itself la. but if you specify a file that doesn't exist it will just create a file so if I touch the file the file will exist again I can remove the file the file no longer exists okay um, we can copy a file so again I touch file um, then I can copy the file to file 2 and then you can see that file 2 exists um, I can I can move a file Move means, move is the same as renaming, right? So I can rename the file or move the file to a different name. Like that. Move, file you want to move and the new name. And then if you ls, you will see that the file has been moved or renamed. So move and rename actually mean the same thing uh, in, in Linux and actually Windows as well. Right? And of course we have pwd, which I mentioned. And touch is to uh, create a file. Um, yeah, these are just some common commands. So let's not spend too much time on uh, this. Hold on. Let me switch to a different uh, viewer. Okay. So, um, so these are some common commands, and um, I'm just going to uh, switch to this thing so that I can um, annotate and then I can know what I should add on later. So I guess most likely I'll add on some stuff. And sorry. Okay. Um okay. So there were some common commands and we'll probably touch on more commands later on. But those are the most common commands that you'll ever use. Like these are all just very basic commands that you need to work in a shell, right? Um, just to move around in your file system, um, create files, move files, you know, list files and get help. Okay, um, some command editing shortcuts, right? Um, so what do you mean by command editing shortcuts, right? Uh, let's say you are typing a long command line, right? So... Uh, So let's say you have a long command line, like that. And uh, you want to edit like the first word, right? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna press left all the way? 
right? Uh, that's going to take a while. So, I mean, you can use home and end, right? But um, people don't like to, you know, if you use home and end, you have to like uh, move your fingers, move your hand to like the home and end, right? So instead, you can just use control A and control E. So control A moves you to the start of the line. Control E moves you to the end of the line, right? And then you have alternate back and alternate forward. So alternate back moves you backwards, one word. Alternate forward moves you forward, one word. And uh, control K. Control K stands for kill, right? K stands for kill, kill the line. Lah. So if you press control K, it will kill the rest of the line, right? And uh, there is a undo as well. So if you press control underscore, which is control shift minus, right? Control underscore, it will undo the last, there's a history, lah, so you can look at the, 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 yeah. Okay, and there's also, there, there are a lot more, there are a lot more, how to say, um, key bindings, right? You can look at the read line documentation. If you want to see more, read line documentation, and you can find out more um, uh, sort of key bindings that are useful, right? Um, so for example, you can use control U, which is like control kill, but it kills from the towards the start of the line instead. And there's also control W, which uh, kills one word. So it's like backspace, but for a single, for entire word instead of um, one character, right? So when you're editing long command lines, um, this may be useful, right? Um, and certain editors have a way to um, yeah, I should add this in as well uh, so, so let's say I have a long let's say I have a long command line here and uh, I want to edit it uh, Okay, much longer than this. And I want to edit it in something more comfortable, right? Uh, depending on your shell, right? it may or may not work, but yeah, so for mine, it doesn't actually work. You can try it out for yours. Um, right. Um, oh, sorry. No. Let me try that again. Yeah, there you go. You can try it out. E. E. Right. You can type Control X. You can press Control X, Control E, and it will open your command line in an um sorry in an editor. So that you can uh, open, you know sort of sorry you so that you can edit the command in a more comfortable manner lah, if it's a very long command right um, and then bash will then execute the command after that so you can try that out like control x control e um, right save exit then bash will run that command so maybe useful if you have to edit a long command you can open it in an editor Okay, um, now let's look at some uh, command control shortcuts, right? Um, so uh, another command that is, uh, we have a command called sleep, right? So we can do sleep um, and you put a number after that. What you'll do is just um, do nothing for however many seconds you specify. So I put sleep 10, um, it will wait for 10 seconds and then it will return. So we'll use this command to... Um, Yeah, we'll use this command to demo demonstrate this uh, command control, right? So let's say I want to terminate a command. The the most uh, most of the time, control C will work. So control C, right? Uh, so this what this uh, thing here means it means controller, right? So control C will terminate the command most of the time, right? Uh, unless the command is uh, catching the interrupt, right? Uh, control C sends an interrupt to the command. So if the command is catching the interrupt, then uh, you know, it may, may not terminate, but most of the time, the command will terminate when you, uh, whatever you are running will terminate when you um, press Control-C, right? Um, 
So control C, terminate the command. Uh, we can press control Z. Z will sort of pause the command or suspend the command, right? Um, that means that it will return you to the terminal. Um, yeah, and then, you know, you can do whatever else. And then when you want to resume the command again, you can press FG. Uh, FG stands for foreground, meaning that we want to bring the command back to the foreground. Uh, and later on, I'll show you what it means because when you talk about when when there's a foreground that means there's a background right so we will talk about a bit about uh, background commands later on right uh, some other shortcuts are control l control l will just clear the screen right and um, let's see there's also control s and control q so if i do like uh, let's see let's have a command It's not. Um, anything of a command that. Okay, so let's say I have a command that uh, repeatedly, you know, the command that is producing a lot of output, right? Um, and we will talk about what this means, what how to do loops in the shell later, but this is just an example, right? So if I want to, you know, if I'm trying to look at some part of the output and I want to pause the output, I can press Control S. Uh, it's not a very good example. But I can press Control S and it will pause. You see the command, the output has paused, right? And I can then press Control Q and then it will allow the command to continue printing. So you can see that it has paused. I, I just press Control S and you press Control Q, it will um, allow the command to continue. And uh, actually, so... If sometimes you are running something in your shell and you notice, and you maybe you accidentally press Control S, and you notice that the uh, you know the command has uh, hung, right? You should try just pressing Control Q in case you accidentally press uh, Control S, right? Okay, so that is just a basic usage of the shell, right? Um, yeah, so I mean the shell is really just uh, you know this I mean this part of the shell uh, that means the prompt where you enter commands right uh, that's all there is to it uh. you enter commands there it will run the commands um, the more interesting part is when we get to the actual uh, shell scripting right uh, so any any questions for this part um, so far If you have stuff that doesn't work, then you just probably just means that it's not installed. Right? Everything is a program after all. So, uh, depending on what is installed by default on your distribution or OS, right? Some commands may not work. Um, I mean, all the com all the common you know utilities will be there, but um, some commands may not be there. Like for example, this calendar command uh, that uh, people are talking about in the chat, those are not that common i have personally never used it um yeah okay if no questions we'll move on to scripting so what is a script um a script is just a list of commands right um and of course you know by writing your commands here you could just key in a script uh command line by line right and run it uh that works too but of course most commonly you would write your um you will write your scripts in a file, right? And then you can run the file as a script later on. So how do you write a script? Um, so you should open up your editor, um, you know, whatever editor you use, right? Uh, it can be a command line editor or graphical editor. Just open up a file, let's say, call it, let's call it um, script, right? So, Normally in a script, the first thing you will have is this line here. What is this line? We call it a shebang. So a shebang line basically tells the, um, right? A shebang line basically tells the operating system um, what program should use to, what program should be used to run this script, right? Um, so if you write in other scripting languages, for example, Python or Node.js or Ruby or whatever, right, you will notice there's a different line. So for example, at the start, uh, maybe like, so this is for Python or, or like, you know, whatever it is. 
um, you know, right. So then what the operating system will do is it will see this line and then it will be, okay, I will run this program and give this, the path, it will give the path to this script, right, um, to that, to this program, so that this program will then run the script for you, right? So in this case, we're writing shell scripts, so our shebang will specify the path to the shell, right? So you can use bin sh or you can use bin bash, right? Um, for this workshop, we will do POSIX compatible scripts, right? We'll talk about POSIX uh, compatible stuff, meaning that just the most basic uh, shell, uh, you know, shell syntax. Okay, so we'll write our script starting with this line, and then after that we can do we can just type our commands after that. So um, something, right? Okay. So once you have uh, created the, you have typed your script, you can save the file. What you need to do is to make the file executable, right? Um, so how you do that? You do chmod plus x. So chmod is of course another uh, shell utility or command line utility, right? Uh, what it does is change file mode change the file mode or you can call it permissions right uh, this just means to add the executable permission and then you can specify it on your script right and then now you will be able to run the script right depending on what you named it and it will run the commands that you specify so in this uh, in this script the command that we have is just like echo something. And so that's what the script does. Lah. Okay. Uh, everyone okay? Uh, please use the Zoom. Um, what do you call that? Yeah. Reactions, thumbs up, something like that. Let me know. If you have any questions or need any help, uh, if you just ask, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so you have seen some flags already, right? Like uh, just now, I talked about the help flag. Right. So most command line utilities will take some flags, right? What are flags? They basically change the behavior of the command, right? Um, and as I've shown just now, the manual page or the help from the program will usually tell you what flags the program accepts, right? Um, yep. So most flags usually come, it depends on the program, right? But most programs will accept, uh, will have some short form flags and uh, some long form flags. So usually the more, the more common flags will be uh, specifiable using a short form. And then the other flags that may be less commonly used will be specified using a long form, right? So normally you have dash, for short form and double dash for long form. Of course, each program can accept, have their own syntax for flex, right? So you should look at the particular commands uh, manual page to be sure of exactly what the format is. And of course, on Windows, you know, the on Windows, the, 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 the Windows actually uses slash, right? So you specify a flag using like slash S or whatever, right? That's Windows. Um, so again, that's just to bring home the point where that uh, the flags are specific to the program, right? And every program can have their own way of specifying flags. And um, most like commonly, right, uh, short flags can be combined, right? So you can just combine them with a single dash and then you can specify them together, right? Um, yeah, This is really just so you can type less. Lah. Let me save this elsewhere. Um, okay. Okay, so now, um, if you look at this, you may have, uh, you may think of something. So what if, for example, um, like since dash starts a flag, right? What if I want to work on a file or operate on a file that starts, whose name starts with a dash? Right, um, like for example, I want to create a file that's, that that is called dash v. So how do I, you know, because I if I do touch dash v, it's going to take it as an option, right, or a flag, and then it will complain there's no such flag v, 
right? So how do I uh, you know, work on a how how do I specify that this is not option, but this is a file name? So most commands will accept this uh, double dash, right? With nothing after it. So just a double dash, and then that specifies that um, this is the end of options, right? And then after which all of these are just uh, you know positional parameters or file names or whatever, right? And that will let you create a file called uh, dash v. And uh, the same applies if you want to delete dash v, right? You rm dash v, it's going to be like, hmm, that's a flag, right? It's going to treat it as a flag. So if you want to delete dash v, you need to do this. And then you can see that dash v is now gone. Yeah. So this dash dash is quite quite universal, I would say. But again, um, yeah, you should look at the particular programs. Um, manual page will help. And hopefully it will say it, but it may not. Then in that case, you should just try. Lah. So some common flags, right? Um, Depending on um, depending on the program, of course, these are just these are not universal, right? They are just common. Um, so dash a, uh, if it's a program that deals with files uh, or lists files, right? It usually means that it will refer to all files. So for example, if I have ls, if I do ls dash a, then it will show the files that are starting with a dot. Right. Um, so in Unix, um, usually files that start with a dot are sort of hidden by default, right? Uh, if you know on Windows you have a hidden file, the idea of a hidden file, right? And that one is a separate flag. On uh, Unix, you usually just do it by setting by making the file name start with a dot, and then it will be hidden uh, from by most utilities by default, right? Um, so if you want to see those files, right, on the command line, usually you specify dash a, uh, depending on the program. Lah. But uh, there are a couple of commands that use dash a. So for example, there's ls, there's tree, right, tree dash a. Okay, tree doesn't actually show it. So we can see. Ah, okay. So I should create a file that is uh, hidden, right? So ls doesn't show it, ls dash a, ls dash a shows it and then tree doesn't show it tree dash a shows that hidden file right so you can see uh, dash a usually for commands that deal with uh, files it will dash a will show all files right even hidden files um, dash f usually refers to forcing something so you can look at the manual page uh, so rm dash help you can see yeah, see dash f uh, refers to force. So what does force do in the context of for RM? It means ignore un non-existent files, right? Um, yeah, so force. And you can look at like CP, copy. And copy also has a force, right? It means um, if the if an error occurs, just delete the destination and try again. Right, so various commands, uh, many commands have a dash F, uh, and it means to force something, but whatever that something is, you should look at the particular command. Lah. Okay. Um, dash H displays a help for, actually not most, lah, um, some commands. Right? Uh, it's probably better to use dash dash help. Well, I'll probably change that. Yeah, let's change this to dash dash help. Right, it's more commonly dash dash help more commonly works than dash h dash h is sometimes a flag, right? uh, so I wouldn't um, use dash h. Uh, but if you're looking for help, use dash dash help. Right, there are certain uh, commands that actually use dash h uh, to show help. So for example, git. Right, uh, dash h gives you a short help. That's for git lah. It's not that universal okay um then there is dash v right and you can see even for git git um dash v means verbose right verbose means it should uh you know give more output uh, say what's happening you know uh, most commands a lot of commands are totally silent that means if it works right you'll just not output anything uh, you can use dash v to for it to say um, for in the case of copy for example if you put dash v 
then it will tell you, okay, I've copied this file to this file, you know, that kind of thing. Right? So uh, it will output more so that you know what is happening. And dash V, so you can look at git dash V. No, doesn't have. Um, yeah, certain programs have dash V as a version flag. Um, oh, actually, more commonly, it's dash version. Uh, yeah. I actually don't know what programs have dash V as a version. Um, yeah, as you can see, these slides are uh, from about, have been sort of improved on for about a couple semesters already. Right? And we will keep iterating. Yeah. Okay, so that's some, um, that's about flags. Um, that's a word about directory structure. When does it look like there is something here? Yeah. So that's a word about Unix uh, directory structure, right? Um, so on Windows, you have the idea of like, uh, you know, uh, you have like a C drive, D drive, right? And everything is just based on the drive, right? On Unix, there is no idea, there's no drive. Actually, this is wrong, right? On Windows, you have like, you have backslash instead. It's so weird, okay? Windows, you have backslash. Oh, okay, so Python has dash B, right? Yeah, there you go, Python. Let me see, what else has it? Nope. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, Unix has uh, no concept of drives, so what we call it is a single a unified, um, you know, a, a directory, a file system um, hierarchy, right? And um, yeah, so you can have, you know, so you may wonder, anyway, this is a bit of a, a side, but you may wonder, like, if I don't have the concept of drives, right? then how do I have multiple partitions on uh, Unix? And the answer is you just, you know, you just have your partitions mounted to particular directories. Lah. So for example, you can have a partition at slash and then slash home can be a different partition and so on, right? Uh, this might be equal to C drive on Windows and maybe D drive on the Win, uh, yeah, for home, you know. Yeah, so that's Unix. And of course, in Unix, we use a forward slash instead of the backslash, right? So if you want to know more about the uh, Unix directory structure, right, you can look up this page, file system hierarchy standard. It will just it basically shows you what is in the um, yeah. It, it basically tells you as in this will tell you how a, a modern Linux systems file system is organized, right? Um, and you can you can look you can look you can see how Windows is organized as well. Now, Windows is has less, like it's just the Windows directory and they don't really say what's inside there. Right, and then you have like program files and users and yeah, whatnot. So some uh, important-ish Unix directory. So all your programs usually go into like bin and sbin and user bin and user local bin, right? Uh, but on a lot of modern systems, these directories are unified, right? Meaning that the they all point they, they are just a single directory. You, you can see that here, um, you see, um, they are uh, symbolic links pointing to the single user bin directory. Right. So that's um, I'm running Arch Linux. So uh, there are certain other Linuxes that also do this now. Right. Um, if I'm not wrong, uh, I think Fedora does it. Yeah. But yeah, you can see whether your system does it by just doing ls-l. Flash, right, and then you can see whether these are symbolic links. Symbolic links are basically like uh, redirections. Um, on Linux, your home directories or basically your user directories are in slash home. Uh, yeah, on Mac OS, it's like here. Mm, you have log files in var log, right? You have like log files here, and then normally you have temporary files in slash tmp. And you notice that my working directory is also in slash tmp, right? So um, depending on your Linux system, mm, slash tmp may be mounted in memory, right? Um, so, you know, if it is, then it's a quite a convenient place for you to uh, just do whatever, like it. Especially if you like, you know, um, if you use an SSD and you're paranoid about uh, SSD where, right? 
then if you're doing like large, you know, sometimes I will compile things. I'll just do compilations and stuff in slash TMP because it's in memory. So it doesn't have to just to reduce a bit of unnecessary wear to my SSD. I know, I know it's kind of uh, unnecessary because SSD lifetimes are long enough nowadays, but um, it's just a habit that I have. And also, uh, and also, you know, uh, TMP is um, memory, right? So if you do stuff in TMP in memory, it will be faster than doing them on disk, typically. Uh, which distros use slash TMP mounted in RAM? I know Arch does, Ubuntu does as well, if I'm not wrong, right? Uh, but you can just check, right? Um, yeah, you can just check, like, um, your. you can just type mount, right? So mount is another command. Uh, this, this is not really related to the shell, uh, but then you can see like uh, where is um, yeah. If you see TMP FS on TMP, then you know that is a memory um, it's a memory file system uh. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so let's go on to actual shell syntax, right? Um, so we all know how to run a command on the shell, right? But what does this actually have? What, oh, you know, like this is actually, you know, part of the shell syntax, right? Uh, because the shell is designed for you to run programs. That's why this is the most basic thing, right? Um, but how does this actually work, right? If you type echo A, B, C. So what ha what's happening is this first line here, this first thing here, this is uh, the path to the program, right? And the remaining stuff are arguments to the program, right? And um, if you have ever written a C program, or if you ever written any program, right? Uh, and took in and uh, like, you know, use command line arguments, then you will know that the arguments are usually an array, right? An array of strings. So uh, how does this command line get split into those array of spring uh, of strings, right? Basically, they are split based on white space, right? So when there's a space, then uh, basically everything, uh, when you have a space, it will be split. It will split the words around it into different separate arguments. So um, this is normally fine. It's just that when you are dealing with things that need to have uh, spaces in them, but you want them to be a single argument, right? Then... Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that later. So you will use quoting. So this is the most basic. Um, this is the most basic part of shell syntax, right? Um, so next thing is uh, variables. So how do you have variables in a shell? You can, uh, this is how you do it, right? You can specify a variable name and then you can just type an equals and then you can type the value of the variable. Now take note that um, you cannot have spaces here or here, right? It has to be name equals value, like that. If you do name equals, um, this is a special syntax uh, that is basically, uh, basically say, says I'm going to set the value of this environment variable and execute the command value, right? And then it will tell you value command not found. If you do name equals value, this is going to treat this as a command. So it's going to run the command name with the arguments equal and value, right? And it'll tell you name command not found. So if you want to set a shell variable, you need to, uh, you cannot have spaces around the equal, right? And then if you want to get the value of the variable, you can do slash, uh, you use dollar, right? So dollar name. And basically how uh, the shell works is basically you'll just replace the, you know, references to variables with the actual value and then you'll interpret that as a command line, right? Uh, in general, right? So if I want to echo name, I can do this and I get the... So now instead of... I won't, this won't be passed to echo uh, as an um, argument, but it will be replaced by the value of this variable, which is... In this case, literally value. La. So I can do multiple of this, and then you get this, you know, and so on. So later on, we'll talk about quoting, right? Um, for now, talk more about special variables. 
So uh, there are some number of uh, special variables, right? So um, this uh, S dollar question mark, this gets you the exit code, right, of the previous command. So what is an exit code? It's just a number that uh, sort of represents uh, success or failure la, of a command, right? Uh, all programs exit with an exit code. But of course, what the exit code means depends on the particular program. Most commonly, zero is a success and then other values are failures. So then depending on the value, uh, that might tell you the actual, um, what do you call it? You know, the actual reason for the failure or the error that happened. So uh, for example, I can do a RM ABCD and you know that RM, uh, sorry, you know that ABCD does not exist, right? Uh, RM complains. So if I now want to look at the value of uh, this, See, the value of this is 1, right? Now, if I remove a file that does exist, so for example, file tree, and I go back to echo the status, you see it's 0. So this means that RM succeeded. So you should be very careful when you use the dollar question mark because you know every command that you run will change that value. So you need to, if you want to check the value of uh, a particular command, you need to access this immediately after running that command, right? You cannot access it later on because that will be the exit code of a different command. Um, so then there are these numbered uh, variables, right? These give you the arguments, right? Uh, 1 to 9 will get you argument 1 to argument 9, right? And argument 0 gives you the name of the script uh, itself, right? So for example, yeah, let's look at uh, the next slide. Uh, we can create a script to that receives arguments, right? And um, yeah, and then we can see how arguments work. So I will create a script. Yeah, okay, let's follow the name in the slides. So we go echo one, echo zero, and then we will echo as hash, save it. Again, um, change the permission to make it executable, then you can do variable example. So you can see that zero will give you the name of the script, right? Or specifically, it's just whatever that the user typed in here. Okay, then uh, one is the first argument or blank if there's nothing. Two is the second argument or blank if there's nothing. And then hash is the number of arguments, right? Uh, not ex not including this, right? So in this case, there were no arguments, so dollar hash is zero. So if I specify a few arguments, then you can see we get the arguments, and we also get uh, yeah the number of arguments, which in this case is four. <coughs> okay, so that is variables, that is uh, arguments, that is um. Variables, arguments, how to run commands. And oh, last thing, um, there's also this special variable called dollar dollar, which tells you the process ID of the current shell. Um, that may or may not be useful uh, depending on what you're doing. Right? Um, but you can get it. Okay. Uh, any questions? Where are variables stored? Variables are stored in the shell memory, right? So the moment you leave the shell, uh, what, the this particular uh, instance of the shell, right? Uh, variables are lost, right? So for example, uh, currently I have this variable, right? Now if I leave and I run the shell again, you can see the variable is not there anymore. So variables are stored in the shell's memory. It's just stored in the shell, right? And it's only there um, while the shell is running. So I can set the value again. And then if I run, then you get the value there again. Okay. So let's go on to loops. How much memory is the shell reserving for variables? Um, it's probably reserved on demand, right? So uh it means when you create a variable it will just allocate memory as needed to store your variables uh 
Um, but anyway, I would suggest, can you read one gigabyte text file into RAM? Yeah, if you have enough memory. Uh, but it's probably not a good idea because it will take, I mean, well, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, normally, if you're saying like one gigabyte of text files, uh, you, depending on what you're processing, you know, uh, you will probably use a program to do it, like a separate program to do it rather than using a shell, right? Um, or shell script. But you can use a shell script to run a program that processes the file, but you will have the program read it instead of your shell. Uh. Typically, you will do that. Yeah, the next session is about awk and set and all that. Next week's session. The data wrangling session. Okay, let's go to loops. So, um, there are two primary kinds of loops in the shell, right? the for loop and the while loop. And if you uh, have done any programming, you will know what uh, for and while loop are. Unless you've, unless you've only done functional programming. I um, guess this is your first time doing imperative. Um, so, what is a, how does a file, uh, sorry, how does a for loop work in a shell? The syntax looks like that. Um, let's give a simpler example. For i in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, do echo as i done. So, um, what will you expect from this? You'll get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So, how does this work? Basically, everything after the in here, in this, this is split by white space. And then the shell will basically set this variable to each of these values one by one and then run your body here. Right? Um, that's basically how a yeah, that's basically how a for loop works in the shell. Now what is this doing? So let's run this uh, so this syntax here is called command interpolation, right? That means it's going to run this command and substitute the output of this command into this command here. So for example, if I just run sec15, you can see I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So by doing for i in, so if I do this, what do you expect me to get without the brackets? Anyone? Without, without this uh, special dollar brackets, what do you think this will give you? Yeah, you get sec15, right? So this special, these brackets are kind of special. It's called uh, interpolation. It will run this command and then it will replace its this part of the command with the output of whatever is inside the brackets, right? And then you can see we get one, two, three, four, five, right? Because this command will return you, uh, I mean, it means sequence one to five. Lah. And you can read more about what you can do with this command as well. So what is the syntax of a for loop, right? Um, yeah. So for x in list, right, x is the variable name. x is the variable name. List is the list. And then we have a body. And then after that, it's uh, done. So the do and done are the equivalents of the curly braces in like your C-based languages, right? Um, and of course, the list, as I mentioned, it is split by white space. So that means, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, spaces, tabs, new lines, right? Uh, C style 4. Um, that is kind of tough. <laughs> so the for loop is like, a, the for loop you have here is basically the for loop you have in, say, Python, right? It's meant for going through a list, right? Um, if you want to use a C style for, you have to use a while loop and a counter variable. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there are a number of ways to write a for loop, right? Um, now this semicolon here is a substitute for a new line, right? So I can also write it like that. Do. So it depends on your preference, lah. Right. Uh, I also you can also write it like this. Right. 
um, the important thing is that um, for right then do then your commands um, and the, the commands the the first command can come immediately after the do right and then there should be a new line or semicolon then after that done right yep so as i was explaining right this command interpolation right uh, does basically does this lah and again this is we're mentioning that this is split by white space so you need to be careful right because let's say you have um yeah okay, so and then uh, let sorry yeah actually we should talk about the white space okay we'll talk about white space in a bit um yeah, so this is the Forman interpolation and then this is the um body of the loop right so you can have of course you can have multiple commands in the body right and then you will just ex execute each of these commands one by one uh, you know as you would expect right um, so that's nothing special there Okay, um, I will talk about this later on, right, this part, so just remind me about that. Okay, so that is a for loop. Everyone okay? Okay. Um, so that's for loop. Um, okay, I should talk about uh, let's talk about while loop as well. Yeah, no. Yes, scripts. You have to be careful with white space in your scripts, right? Um, especially, uh, yeah, we'll talk about white space in a bit. Yeah, here. Okay, so let's talk about if first. Um, so what does this do? If test dash d bin, then echo true, else echo false, right? Um, so, what does this do? Well, let's run it first and we'll see. You can see it return, it, it prints out true. So, how does this work? Um, the syntax here is if condition, then body, then finish. So what is condition, right? Um, in shell, the condition is a command, right? Um, it's not like other languages where the sh condition is a logical expression, right? In the shell, condition is a command. What does it do? It will run this as a command, and depending on the exit status, right? Depending on the exit status, if the command succeeds, it will go to the then. If the command fails, then it will go to the else, right? And uh, you can also have else if, right? So how will you use an else if? It looks like this. Uh. Uh, And you can see, and you can see that we echo number two, right? Because we go to this else if, which this is true, or this succeeds. So then, what is this test command? You can check the man pages, right? Uh, yeah. So this test is actually a command, right? And uh, what does this? What what kind of uh, arguments does this command take? Uh, it takes various expressions. So what are we using here? We're using dash d, and if you check what is dash d, uh, dash d is checking whether the whatever you specify here exists and is a directory. So that's what this command is doing: it's checking whether slash bin uh, is a directory, right? And it exists. 
So if it is if this is true, then the command will return zero or uh, exit code zero, right? And therefore, um, I mean, it will return a successful status, which is zero. Uh, if it doesn't exist, then it will return um, non-zero or one. So a more common syntax that you may see is this uh, square brackets, right? So it's actually the same. So I can do like um, okay. Um, yeah. So this is equivalent to test dash d in. Now, uh, it's important that you have the spaces around the brackets, right? Because otherwise, you know, if you do, remember this is a command, right? And it's going to run this as a command. So if you do this, It's going to run this as a command and it, there's no such command as square bracket dash d, right? So it's going to fail. So the spaces here are important, right? If you were to use this syntax, otherwise you can just use the test syntax. Yeah, uh, okay. The double square brackets are separate and uh, I will talk about that in a bit, but not just yet. Okay, so um, so we have talked about if, right? Um, there is also a while loop, right? So what's the difference between if and while, right? Uh, if, uh, while is quite similar to if, right? Basically you have while condition, do body, done, right? So while here the condition is just like if it's a command. So how does this work? It will just uh, every basically you run the condition. If the condition is successful, then you run the body and then it will keep repeating until the condition is false. So for example, Oops, so it's not then, it's do. So of course, this condition is going to be always true, right? So this loop will never end, right? But this is a while loop, right? Um, so I will talk about the double square brackets uh, later. This is, it, it will be mentioned later on uh, um, when we deal with white space. So um, let's have a command. So let's create a small script, right? Um, using what we have uh, learned so far. Uh, what we want the script to do is to print uh, directories, right? So let's, uh, so that's what this uh, example script here does. Lah. So we are using ls. ls will give us the names, right? And then we can um, loop through each of the names. Then we can check, is this file name a directory? And then if so, we will print the directory name. So let's do that. I'm just going to name it like ls-ders. And then we can do So yeah, the way to end an if is fi. The way to end a for loop is done, right? So yeah. For do done, if then fi, which is the reverse of if. So again, as usual, set it to um, executable, then you can run it. And uh, in this case, I don't have any, I don't have any directories, so it's not gonna output anything. So if I make a directory.
if I make a directory, then um, you will then you will see that it is now listed. Do I purposely omit quotes? Yes, because I have a, there's a whole slide, a couple of slides about quotes. Yeah, quoting is a complicated topic in Shell because there are different kinds of quotes and they all they do different things, right? So uh, there are a few slides on quotes, and I'll talk about them uh, in 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 a moment. So you can get this to work, right? And now we get to our problem, right? Uh, remember we are talking about how f uh, or how for loop splits by white space, right? Uh, now the question is, what if I have a directory whose name is uh, has a space in it? So let me make a directory, right? Uh, or let me make a file, right? Make a file. Um, so in order to avoid using quotes, I'm going to okay. So a file. In order to avoid using quotes, I'm going to use a text editor to save the file instead. So a file with a space in the name. Save. Okay, so you can do that. If you know how to use quotes, then feel free to use that. I'm just avoiding it. So you can see I now have a file with a space in the name. And if I now as this, Okay. Obviously, it doesn't error, right? Uh, because this is a file. Okay. So I'm going to use my text edit, my graphical uh, utility. Right. Um, let's go back to this directory that I'm in. I'm going to create a new directory with a with a space in the name. Okay. So now I have a directory with a space in the name. To exit. Now if I ls this, it doesn't show up. Why is that? That's because it's if I, you know if I look at my script, right? It's so what happens is this gets split into um for f in. In my case it's a the with a space in the name. And then it's going to, you know, do the test. It's going to do this test on each individual word of the directory name, which obviously the test will fail, and therefore it's not considered a directory. So, uh, how will you fix this? Um, so that is one uh, sort of con of um, for loops in Bash, right? Because it splits the you know it splits the list based on any white space and it's actually very hard to get around this right um yeah so if you are working with files and you are trying to list files uh the proper way is to actually well we actually talk about the solution next right so before i give the solution um we can try another solution. What if I use a quote, right? Uh, I haven't really talked about how quotes work yet, but what do you think this does? If I put this whole thing in a quotes, in quotes, uh, what do you think this does? Any guesses? Uh, no, it doesn't test if it's a string, right? If you put in a quotes, no, it's not a literal uh, S L S either. So we can see what happens. Test too many arguments. Huh. So I'm going to put this in quotes as well. And you see that nothing comes out. So what do you think is happening? We can actually test it out, right? Okay, so it's not very obvious from here, but what is happening is this entire thing is being tested as a single file name, right? Um, and therefore, we don't get any results because there is no file with this as a name. I mean, this whole chunk, right? 
So what's the correct way to, if you want to, uh, you know, loop through files in your, if you want to loop through files, what's the correct way to do it? You should use a glob, right? You probably have seen such patterns before. So if I do ls star, or I can do echo star, let's do echo star, right? Um, you see that we get, um, you know, we get each of the, we, we get all the file names in the current directory, right? Um, and if we do variable example star, you can see that we get, you know, each argument is one file name in the directory. Right? And so, how do you fix this script, right? You should replace this with a star. And then bash will replace this with basically um, all of the file names matching this pattern, right? And then it will work. Uh, so the important thing is to quote this so that this entire file name, even though it has spaces, is passed to test as a single argument, right? Um, if you do not quote it here, it's going to be split up the value of f is going to be split up into multiple arguments uh, if there are spaces in f. So uh, that's quoting, right? Now, um, you notice here I use double quotes, right? So what's the difference between double quotes and single quotes? Uh, or is there a difference in the first place? So um, in bash and in, in most POSIX compatible shells, right? Uh, let's see, we have name. Okay. So this will expand. If you have double quotes, it will still expand uh, variables. It's just that the whole expansion will become a single uh, token or single argument. Now, if I use quote, single quotes, then it's not going to do any uh, variable expansion. It's just going to take the whole part literally. Yeah, so that's the difference between single and double quotes. So now a bit more about globbing, right? So I, so far I've just used a single star, right? But you can specify different things. So for example, yes, this. So uh, Elvin asked about this, uh, what do you call it, grave accents or backticks, right? Uh, this is basically the same as this. Yeah, but this is a bash specific syntax. So if I were you, I would use this. This is the POSIX compatible syntax, and this is the bash compatible syntax. I mean, this is a bash uh, specific syntax. So I'll avoid using that, and I'll just use the, this instead. Okay, back to globs. So just now I show you, if you echo star, it's just going to match every file name in the directory, right? Uh, now, if I do echo there, so you, you, you can, uh, if you specify other, you know, you can specify like for example like that and then it's going it's only going to match files that eh, how to say it's only going to match file names that match this pattern so it starts with dir and then end with any string of characters right so you do like that right or you can do like this question mark just matches a single character right note that star actually also matches uh, empty string, right? Yeah. And also note that um, you, if you quote, if you quote the glob patterns, then they will be treated literally. So if I do dear star, it's not going to expand it, right? If you want to, if you want to deal with spaces, what you can do is this, right? So Nick, just note that the uh, pattern or the glob is outside of the quotes, right? As long as the pattern is you know, the star question mark, it's outside the quote, then bash will treat it as a pattern. Yeah, you can do this, right? Then you get all names that include there. Well, you can even do this. It, it's kind of pointless, la. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, and then last but not least, you have um, 
So let's say I want a. So I can do this. And then uh, this will match, you know, any of these characters or in fact sequences. So I can even, even do this. Right. Um, and in fact, this is not uh, this is not specifically a pattern. It's sort of an expansion. So um, you can do this. What do you think this expands to? So this is not actually a. Uh, this doesn't actually match files. This is just expanding a pattern. This uh, you can yeah. It just expands things. So if I put, for example, so this is a shorthand to uh, expand things. So actually, this here is equivalent to. So this thing here. Uh, so let me just type it again. Huh? Right, this is equivalent to like that, right? Um, yeah. So when you glob, um, every file becomes a single argument, even if the file name has spaces uh, uh, in it, right? So then it that solves the issue we have here, right? That solves the issue we have here when we use ls, but when you use this f variable, you still need to make sure to quote the usage. Otherwise, it's going to be expanded into uh, multiple arguments. Okay, and of course, you can even match in uh, subdirectory. So for example, like that, um, you know, yeah, you can match like all text files in uh, the directory foo, and so on. Okay. All right. Okay, so now let's move on to more uh, white space issues. So if you will look, look at the test um, if you look at the manual for test, you notice this. So you can compare strings, right? Um, so let's say I will have a variable. I already have a variable name, right? Um, so I want to compare with name equals value. Do then echo equal else. Uh, so you can see name equals value. Uh, therefore, it's equal. Now, um, the question is, what happens if uh, name is empty? So let's use another variable, name2. Uh, name2 is empty, and uh, we end up with... So when this variable is empty, uh, it's just going to be replaced by nothing. And what you end up with is, if equals value, then... Right. And this is not valid syntax, right? So what happens? Um, you end up with an error, right? Because bash is expecting, or the this operator or this command is expecting something here, but it's there's nothing there. So how do you deal with it, right? Uh, one way is to prefix. This is a common way to do it. You put an X in front, so then uh, it will just compare you know, if this is empty, then you just compare x equals to this x value. It's not true. Um, so that's one way to deal with it. Uh, the other way, dash eq is for integers. Equal is for strings. So the question was, what's the difference between equal and eq, right? Equal is for integers. Uh, the equal sign is for strings. Okay. So anyway, yeah, one way is to prefix an x here. The other way is to use this. Um, see this double, uh, double quotes? So the double quotes, um, double quotes, double square bracket is roughly mostly the same uh, as the single square bracket. The syntax is just that there is some um, special handling to deal with empty strings, right? So I can do
you can see it's not equal and there is no error. And if I now set, this works as expected, right? Um, yeah. So the only thing is that you don't have a manual entry for this. So if you are looking for the manual entry for that, I would recommend you go to the bash manual. And let me look it up. I will recommend you go to the bash manual and uh, you can look up this uh, section here on uh, yeah how this particular um, double square bracket uh, conditional works, right? Um, it has a bit more features than the normal test, so you can check out those as well, right? Uh, but the basic syntax is equivalent to the normal, you know, test command. Right. So I will send the link to this. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, now, shell check. So what is shell check? Um, so the command, the the issues that we talked about like white space, this and that, right? These are common bugs in shell scripts, right? So there is a tool called shell check that you can use. So let us um, take our script, right? and um, paste it into shell check and we will see what um, shell check says so yeah so it tells us we should quote it and it does no more issues detect so the original script we had this and shell check complains see uh, iterating over ls output is fragile use globs right so shell check quite useful um, helps you prevent bugs in your shell script so this is equivalent to like your eslint or like um, whatever linter you use la, for your language, like um, Clippy or whatever it is, or your compiler warnings la, uh, if you use like um, compiled languages. Okay, um, any questions so far? All right, so let's move on. So now we move on to composability. Uh, okay, before we go to that, maybe I should talk about, yeah. Yeah, before I go on to composability, let's talk about this part that I said I will talk about later, right, which is the path, right? So, you know, so far we've been typing all these commands like echo, one, two, three, or like ls, um, or like cat, right? Uh, all these commands, we're just typing the name of them and uh, bash knows how to execute them so now how do you know like where are these programs actually located right um, so how this works is actually bash is looking the commands uh, looking for these commands in the path so you know whenever you install some new whatever programming language or something like that they might say something like add it to your path right what does that mean it means to add it to this path variable uh, in your shell so that you can use the commands in that language uh, conveniently. La. Otherwise, you have to specify the full path. So how do you know where a command is located? There are a couple of ways. One of them is using which. So I can say which ls and it'll tell me, okay, um, yeah, uh, ls is actually here, right? Um, or, yeah, you know, there's another um, Yeah, the other way is to use type, right? You can also type ls, um, and it'll tell you the location of the command, or like type rc, whatever, right? And it'll tell you what uh, the command is. Yeah, so type is itself a shell built in. So I type 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 is a shell built in. What does shell built in means? Means is built into the shell itself versus being a uh, external command. So for example, if I type uh, echo. It will also be a shell built-in, right? So actually, if you want the non-built-in echo, you have to do this. And then you get the non 
built-in echo. Right? Um, so certain commands are shell built-ins. And the way you can tell is by using type. Right? And type can also tell you where a particular program is located. Okay, so that is the path. Right. And uh, what does the path look like? You can actually just see. Right. Um, so the path is just a colon separated uh, list of directories. Right. And basically, whenever you enter a command, uh, bash will go and look in all of these directories in this order for that particular command. Uh, and if it finds it, it the first you know, first exit, uh, the first program that it finds, you know, uh, you'll use that as the command. Okay, makes sense. Okay. Okay. So now let's go on to composability, right? Uh, so once the the powerful thing about the shell is that you know you can sort of chain programs together, um, and you know rather than having one program do multiple things. Uh, when you do things like echo dollar path, why do you want to quote? Uh, actually, okay, for in the case of echo, there's no real reason. Lah. Um, you don't need to. Uh, it's just a habit that I have because, you know, in most of the time, you don't want to accidentally white space. Uh, you don't want your, the value of the variable to be uh, sort of split uh, by white space. Of course, for echo, it doesn't matter. Lah, but it's just a habit. I guess, uh, that, you know, um, so that when you, like, it's just a habit that, you know, when I write other, when I use variables with other commands, then I, I always quote them like, just to avoid the argument splitting. So unless you explicitly want uh, the arguments to be split, um, then you leave out the quotes. Otherwise, it's good practice to just always quote them. Um, should you always use printf instead of echo? No, right? If you don't need the, you know, so there is this shell command called printf, right? But, you know, this format here is, is, is a, you know, has all these format strings, right? You shouldn't always use it because if you are not using the format specifiers, then, you know, printf is going to pass your string as a format string, right? Anyway, uh, which is a waste of, uh, you know, waste of compute power, right? If you're not using the format string, then just use echo. La. Echo will just directly print everything instead of passing it. Uh, even, yeah. That makes sense, right? Okay. So, let's go on to composability. Um, yeah. So, this ties in with the Unix philosophy, right? Uh, two and three, right? Uh, we want programs to be able to work with each other. And one of the ways that Unix does that is by making programs all uh, deal with plain text uh, streams. And what do we mean by plain text streams? Basically, the output is always plain text, and uh, most commands will accept plain text as input. So when I say input, I mean like uh, input from the uh, in, like in and out of standard input and output, right? Um, yeah, if What is, okay, wait, before we get to that, what is standard input and output, right? So standard output is basically whatever the command prints out to the um, screen, right? Uh, that is usually either on standard output or there's also this other thing called standard error, right? Uh, standard error is usually used for errors, right? Standard output is usually the output. So like ls, ls will print its output to standard output, right? Um, so... Let's use this command, tail, right? So, okay, when you run some commands and it hangs, or it looks to hang, right? Um, what's actually happening is that it is probably probably reading from standard input, right? So it's standard input is, by default, the terminal. So if I enter... So what does tail do by default? It prints the last uh, roughly like 10 lines. Um, yeah, nine or ten lines, right? So, uh, you can see I've keyed in these lines into standard input, and then tail will print it out to standard output, right? Um, yeah. So, 
Uh, that's not very useful if I have to keep keying in things in and out via the terminal, right? So what you can do, and what the shell lets you do, you see this pipe character, right? Uh, shell, the shell lets you redirect output from, um, you know, uh, standard input. Sorry, it lets you redirect output from standard, uh, from one program's standard output into another program's standard input, right? Um, and that way, you can sort of compose programs together, right? So for example, I have ls. Okay, let's ls slash, right? So I have a number of files in uh, slash. And um, so let me just pipe it through cat. Okay, so um, just an aside, there are some programs that will change their output format depending on where it is being output to, right? So for example, uh, ls will output to uh, ls if it's things if it uh, sees that it's outputting to a terminal right it will format it in a more compact manner but if it sees that it's not outputting it's outputting to another program right then it will all just print one per line so that's why i forward to cat so that i can see what kind of output that i will uh, i will deal with so now we can uh, compose. Uh, let's say I want the last uh, few lines of this up only. Let's say I can do uh, slash and pipe it to tail, right? And then I only get the last 10 lines, right? And if you look at the manual page for tail, you can see, okay, I can control the number of lines that I can get. So let's say I want the last output of ls. Do uh, ls slash and pipe it to tail and one, right? And this will let me uh, get me the last line of the output of this program. So this is how you compose programs in a shell, right? So, um, so this is a bit of a contrived example. It's not very useful. But let's say... <coughs> um, so, uh, let's do general CTL KB. So this is a command on Linux that will get you the system log, right? Specifically, specifically the kernel log. So in a nutshell, it produces a lot of output, lah, right? Uh, produces a lot of output, and um, so it's a bit troublesome if I want if I'm searching for something in that output, right? So let's say I want to search for something in this um, particular, uh, you know, particular log file. I can use this tool called grab, right? So what does grab do? Grab will basically filter for lines that match this uh, particular pattern, right? Uh, you can check the manual page for grab to see what I mean by pattern. It's a regular expression, right? Uh, but you can ignore the fact that it's a regular expression and just use it like a search, right? So let's say I'm searching for things that happen at um, 2 p.m. today, right? Oh, okay, then this will give me everything that happened at 2 p.m. today, right? Uh, or I can search for a particular word. So like, uh, oh, I'm looking for things that uh, have to do with Bluetooth, right? So you can see, okay, uh, I grab for Bluetooth and it only print me. So basically, journal CTL will print out all of the lines and it will be piped to grab. And then grab will only print out the lines that match Bluetooth. So this is how you can compose programs uh, in Linux, right? And then let's say I only want the latest line or the last line. Then I can do tail and one and now give me the last line of the particular output. Right? So the the takeaway from this is that, you know, all of these programs are independent programs, right? They are not written to work with grab, right? Journal CTL was not written to work with grab. Grab was not written to work with tail, not specifically, but because they all operate um, using plain text, right? Um, th that enables this sort of interoper uh, interoperability, right? And, uh, you know, you can just use programs that were never designed to be work to work together, but you can use them together to uh, achieve quite complicated things, right? Um, and, you know, um, there are many... You know, when you have... Um, if you keep this in mind, then every time you learn a new shell utility, right, you can use them and compose them with other utilities to um, do various things right and of course uh, next week's uh, next week's workshop on uh, command line data wrangling will basically make use of this a lot we'll be piping things from 
different programs that help you solve do different things right um, so if you're interested in that i encourage you to attend next week's uh, workshop as well right so uh streams right so i was talking about standard input output and error right um yeah. so every program has uh three streams right by default uh standard input is always usually where a program reads input from right this is of course um different from the arguments right so there's always a command line arguments but there's also standard input so the arguments are something usually arguments are what sort of change the behavior or tell the program what you want to do right and then the input is what the program is operating on right um yeah and then you have standard output this is where the output usually goes by default and then you have the standard error standard error uh, right um and this is usually where errors you know error pro error messages go right so by default when you use this pipe um the it is only the standard output that is redirected right so basically this way you know a program can still print error messages to let you see even if its output is being redirected to another program right so by default the standard input and output and error are basically your keyboard and the terminal and terminal respectively right um, so what you can do is to redirect them right which is what we have done here so piping right is one way to redirect these uh, inputs right so this makes this will connect the uh standard output of the first command and the standard input of the second command right that's the pipe there's also this uh, file redirection so uh, i can redirect the uh, output of a to the file foo so for example uh file right uh my files so i've just redirected the output of ls slash to files so if i now look at the contents of files right now this contains the output of ls slash now i can um i can redirect the standard error of this command to the file files so since i'm redirecting the standard error only then you can see that the standard output is not redirected so it goes to my terminal and what is in my files nothing right because uh, there is nothing printed on the standard error so now if i do like uh, a non-existent file okay you see that there is nothing printed right normally if i ls a non-existent file uh, there will be an error right so then if you look at files you can see that the standard error was redirected to files right and you can do multiple redirections in a single command so if i files uh, errors and i do uh, results right now you can see I can cat results. Results is empty because uh, it was an error, and then we can cat errors, and then errors will have the error. So you can do multiple redirections in a single, um, you know, command stream or command line. Just be careful with the pipe. So if you want to do, if you want to pipe, um, oh, you can't. You can only pipe, um, for example, this and this, right? These two redirections. You cannot have both of them because both of these are redirecting standard output so you can either redirect standard output to a file right or you can redirect it to another program you can't do both because there's only one standard output right um then <coughs> uh, there is um this other carrot to the left and this is to redirect standard input so normally let's say grab um let's say i want to grab for oops okay so let's say i want to grab um i want to search for something in a file right what you can do is just uh let's see home so now grab will take its input from the file files right um, of course a lot of programs actually support you know reading from a file directly so you sometimes you don't have to use this uh, redirection operator right uh, but yeah 
Okay. And then uh, there is this... Um, Yeah, so there is this uh, grab, there is this triple uh, left arrow, and what this does is basically make the input of the program to be equals to whatever comes after this. Lah. So I can do like home, and you can see that. Uh, yeah, so this will make the, this will make this the input of this program, right? And finally, uh, so I mentioned just now, you can only, uh, you can only use this or this together, right? But there is a program that lets you, um, sort of work around this, right? There is this program called T. Uh, and what T does is it basically T's the output in a sense that it um, writes it to a file and at the same time, it also forwards it to its own standard output so that you can then forward it um, to another program. So I can do this, like uh, T uh, files and then I can grab home, right? And you can see that uh, home is, we, you know, so the output is the same, right, as if I just did this, but then um, it's also written to the file files, right? So I can see the full output of the this command. So that is T, right? And you can read uh, in the manual pages what T does. Okay, so what again, you know, what's the use of these uh, redirections, right? It lets you compose, you know, uh, multiple programs and manipulate the output of a program. So, for example, you know, uh, I can search for files that contain the word foo, or I can search for processes that contain the word foo. You know, I can search through logs and use grab and entail. Right, and again, as I said, this is the basis of data wrangling, which we will talk about in next week's workshop. Okay. Now, um... Uh, grouping commands. So let's say you have multiple commands and you want to, you know, redir redirect. Um, my God, my tongue is really. You want to redirect the output um, together into a single uh, third program. What can you do? You can use the brackets uh, or parentheses like this, right? So let's say I want to ls slash and ls uh, slash bin, right? And I want to uh, grab all of them together. Then I can grab like oh, like that, right? And you can see that the output of these two commands are uh, sort of joined together, and then it's forwarded, it's redirected to grab, right? So you can group commands together like that. Yeah, and there's another command here called tech, right? T A C. Um, so you can see what TAC does, right? Right, it just prints them in reverse, right? So that's, and it's of course the reverse of cat. CAT. The reverse of CAT is TAC, and TAC prints stuff in reverse. Yeah. Okay, um, so there's this idea of process substitution. Um, so, what does this do? Basically, it creates a temporary file from the output of a process, and then you can pass that, uh, you know, you can pass that um, the file name to another, the output to another program, right? That expects a file as input. So, if I do this, you can see that it gets a file as, e echo is printing a file. So, this is replaced by a file name. Right, so how is this useful? Right, basically, if you need a program, if you use a program that you, uh, expects files as input, for example, diff, right? So, if you use yeah, yeah, diff expects uh, files as input, so you can use this in order to solve diff the output of uh, two different programs, right? Um, and diff is a tool that tells you the differences between files. If you ever use git, this might be a more familiar format for you, right? Dash u stands for unified uh, diff. Yeah. So that is process substitution. Mm. 
I personally don't use it that often, right? Uh, but, you know, it can come in useful sometimes, right? So, and just keep in mind that this whole thing is an entire command line. So, you know, you can you can do some, you know, uh, you, you can do redirection and, and, you know, other streams and whatever not. And then you substitute the whole thing into another program, right? So you can see how a shell is very powerful. Okay, uh, now job control. So, um, just now I was, remember when I did this uh, 100 and then I did control Z and then I did FG and I was saying that, oh, this is foreground, right? So what does it mean? Uh, if there's foreground, that means there should be background, right? So this is where we get to background. So, um, so if I, now I, if I run this command sleep 100 and I put uh, ampersand, right? It's going to run that program in the background, you see? So this means that the program is now in the background. And um, so now actually why? And this program is now running in the background. So if I want to bring it back to the foreground, I can type FG. It'll bring it back to the foreground, right? I can press Control Z again. And it will pause the program. Then if I want to continue the program in the background, I can type uh, background and the uh, program will continue in the background. And yeah. So now, um, how do I see what programs I have running? You can use the command jobs, right? It'll tell you what jobs you have running, right? Uh, again, we have this command FG, right? Um, if you want to bring a, let's say you have multiple commands in the background. Now we can have multiple jobs. Now, if you want to select a program to run in the background, then you can just uh, type it using a percent, right? So let's say I want to bring percent two in the background. You'll bring this to the background. I can bring it back into the background. I can have uh, program one, bring it to the foreground, and I can um, you know, continue in the foreground. I can continue in the background and so on, right? And um, so let me now kill and uh, so you can basically refer to jobs using um, this uh, percent one, percent two, right? And you can use them with certain shell built-ins, for example, kill, right? And kill will terminate a job. Okay. And um, when you run a command like that, um, sometimes you need the PID, for example, to use it with the command like kill or whatever, right? Send a signal to it. So then you can use this uh, dollar exclamation mark so you can see that this uh, is the same as this, right? So that's the PID or process ID of this new background process. And I can bring it back to the foreground and kill it. Right. Um, so these are some shell utilities. Um, running out of time. Actually, I'm out of time, but uh, let's just finish. Uh, if you have to go, feel free to just watch it uh, via the recording, but I'm going to continue. So, uh, PS is a tool to, uh, sorry, PS lists uh, running processes, right? Um, PS is a tool that has a lot of arguments, right? Um, but one of them is like PS-A. So if you want to view all processes on your system, that's what you can do. Um, of course, what I like to, what I prefer to use interactively is like HTOP, but um, that's a talk for a different lecture. I mean, a different workshop, sorry. <laughs> that's a topic for a different workshop. Um, yeah. So some other tools, you can use pgrep. pgrep lets you search uh, a process based on name. So I can search for like Firefox and it tells me the process ID of uh, Firefox right, or whatever. Um, or like bash, right. Tells you the PID of those processes. And uh, there are other things that uh, it can search based on as well. So you should check out the manual page. And I'll keep saying that. Uh, kill. Kill is a thing to send a signal to a process, right? Um, don't worry if you don't really know what a signal is. This is somewhat of a Linux or Unix thing. It's not really a shell thing, right? Uh, so some common signals are sig kill, right? Kill is to um, tell a process to... It basically terminates a process immediately. And um, yeah, there's also sig term, which is basically... It's a sort of tell a process to terminate uh, or exit gracefully, right? Um, there's also some other processes. For example, mm, 
right? When you do this, uh, control Z, and you see this stopped, this is also a signal, this is called a six stop, right? And then when you bring it back to the foreground or background, what the shell is doing is also sending it a signal called a uh, sig cont, right? Or continue. So you can actually do this yourself using kill. So for example, if I get um, I get the PID of uh, this command. Oh, sorry. There is um, how do I get a PID? Yeah. So now I got the PID of this command, right? I can kill kill stop that PID, and then you see that oh now the shell tells me that it has stopped, right? Um, and then while it is stopped, I can just kill it. And then the shell will say, oh, it's killed. Yep. Okay. Um, so we are basically at the end, right? Um, just realized that these two slides are duplicated, so I'll sort of fix this. Yep. So, um, there are more resources you can look through. Um, this was a kind of a crash course to bash and scripting and the syntax and all. Um, hopefully this will let you write your own scripts and then, uh, but in, the thing about the shell is that you can only, you know, you mainly use the shell to control or to run other programs that do the dirty work for you, right? So, um, yeah. That, and you know, the kind of, Programs that you will use really depends on what you're doing. And shell, shell scripts are, can be used to do anything. Right? Um, honestly, they are used to do too many things in, in Linux. So um, sometimes I will say maybe it's a better idea to write a proper, you know, a script using a proper language rather than using a shell script. Uh, but really it depends on what you're doing. So you can check out these guides uh, in the slides. Um, hopefully you have the link. Um, I'll send the link again. Um, if not, you can uh, check. I will update the slides based on some of the things that I noticed, right? Um, or yeah, I discussed uh, some of the extra stuff that I discussed in the in the workshop, and um, you can check out the updated slides. Um, I'll probably I'll mention it in the in our annual hackers chat, right? Not not the channel because I think the channel will be too spammy if I do that. And I also send the I'll put the link in the event. Um, post on our website as well yeah okay so um basically the end so there are more resources why well, I, I do recommend checking out the manual right the manual is quite useful um i did link it earlier right uh, the manual basically tells you everything about the uh, about the shell uh, i mean shell syntax right um, of course it doesn't really tell you about shell or command line utilities right Th those are separate from the shell itself uh, more utilities um, we have SCD. Uh, actually, we'll be talking about this um, next week, so uh, stay tuned. Right, and some other utilities that I use are RG. Um, it's also known the full name is Rip Grab, right? And it's a slightly improved version of Grab, right? Um, I say improved because it basically it does some nice things. For example, it will um, honor your git ignore file, right? So that you don't have to, um, you know. For example, if you're writing a Rust program or whatever, right, Grab will go and go ahead and search in like your binaries and things like that and dependencies, right? Um, which you don't want, right? Uh, so Rip Grab will automatically uh, honor your git ignore file and it will not search through, you know, those binary files and whatnot. <coughs> um, there's also Starship, right? So Starship lets you customize your shell prompt, right? Like this. Um, you can use it with any shell, right? It's it works with any shell. You can go check out the website and see how to install it and configure it. Yep. Okay. Um. So we're basically at the end. Uh, there are a couple of exercises. Um. Yeah. Before we go through the exercises, right? Um. If you are going to leave, our uh, we we will appreciate it if you could fill in our um, what's that feedback form. Send the link to the chat. Uh, yeah, we'll appreciate it if you could fill in our feedback form and um, 
Yeah. So see you next week for the next week's hacker tools, uh, CLI data wrangling, right? Um, yeah. That will be a continuation from this week's right um, workshop. Okay. So last part, uh, exercises. So I'm going to go through these exercises. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have time, uh, please do stay, right? Uh, if not, you can just check it out in the recording. Um, yeah. So um, not all, how to say, not all programs will, um, for example, you cannot just blindly pipe into any program, right? Because not all programs accept input via standard input. For example, file, right? File, um, file doesn't accept, you know, input or arguments via um, standard input, right? It expects, like, if file, file expects the um, argument via the command line. So exactly, uh, before that, what does file actually do, right? File will tell you what kind of file something is. So if I do, like, um, Right, they will tell me, oh, this file is a PDF, right? Uh, that kind of thing. But let's say I want to um, check out. Mm. Let's say I want to check out um, the types of all the files in the in my slash tmp, or in this directory. So I do that. Um, then file is like, huh? Because file does not expect you to pass file names via the command line. Oh, sorry. doesn't expect you to pass in file names via the standard input, right? It only expects file names on the uh, command line, like as arguments. So what can you do, right? You can use this thing called sarcs, xarcs. I don't know how you pronounce it, but yeah, xarcs. So what does xarcs do? It will take your input from standard input and it will convert them into command line arguments, right? So we can see how that works. If I do just xarcs echo, Right, you can see that it actually, you know, it it's as if I, how to say, it's as if I specified all the arguments on the command line. Right, um, see if I remove the xarcs, nothing comes out because echo doesn't look at standard input. Echo only, just echoes whatever you say, whatever you pass to it as command line arguments. So, you can use xarcs. And it will sort of convert your command line, uh, convert your standard output into command line arguments, and therefore you can use this with files, uh, with commands that expect um, command line arguments, right? Uh, Tada! Right. Uh, so now there is a problem, right? Because um, xarc also splits by space, right? But you can do some things like, for example. Um, See, x arcs, um, you can change the delimiter. So in this case, we can just say delimit by. Mm, sorry. Dash D. Yeah, we can say delimit by a new line or just a new line character, and therefore it will split properly by the new line. Actually, the best practice is to. Um, Oops. Okay. Now doesn't do it. But um so there is this, you see this first argument, right? Um arguments are separated by a null, right? So there are certain programs that also support this uh, output using a null, right? For example, find. So I can do this. And that will also deal with the um, spaces, right? Um, yeah. So you can check out more about this uh, null separation. Um, not all programs support it, but um, whenever you use with xarc, it's recommended that you use um, use it with, if, if the program that you're piping into xarc supports uh, separating by null, it's good to use that. Yeah, and uh, you can also check out more about find. Find is a very useful uh, command, right? It lets you find uh, stuff based on various things, so you can filter based on uh, 
you know, like file size, uh, modification time, the name, and, and so on and so forth. Yep, so that is XArx. Okay, and um, yeah, I've already mentioned this, right? Uh, I've already mentioned what this does, so what do you expect this to do? Any guesses? Yeah, exactly. Cross product, right? So you get AA, AB, BA, BB. Right? Um, I've talked about what T does. Right, again, so T, what it does is it will uh, forward the, it will duplicate the output to the file and at the same time output to standard output. So you can sort of use this to capture the sort of you can capture the stream in the you, you can capture what is in the middle of the stream right and uh, finally there is this uh, double so just now we mentioned echo we have this echo xyz right um sorry we have this single uh, carrot or single arrow i guess right so a single arrow you do this if you repeat the command Right, there's still only a single line there. So what happens is, every time you use this um, redirection, it will overwrite, it will empty this file and then um, basically overwrite it with the contents of this command. Now if you use a double um, arrow, and you notice that there are now two, um, two lines, and I change the input, now there are three lines. So what the difference is that, um, this will cause it to append to the file rather than to overwrite it. Yep. So depending on what you want to do, you use one of the, one or the other. Lah. Yep. Okay, so that is uh, actually it. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, if not, uh, thank you for attending our workshop today. Um, sorry for running over time slightly. Um, and hope to see you um, next week at uh, command line data wrangling where we will basically expand on uh, what we have discussed today and basically see how we can process lots of different kinds of data using just the command line so thank you and again um, would appreciate it if you could fill in our uh, feedback form 